Welcome to Real Estate 360 Live with Ryan Sloper, the trusted name in real estate radio. Now, here's Ryan Sloper. All right, guys, welcome back to the program, Real Estate 360 Live. I'm your host, Ryan Sloper. For those of you not familiar with our show, we do a weekly podcast. Um, we talk, discuss everything in the markets, the real estate markets, that is, from interest rates to the economy to what's happening in Washington. Anything that could affect our local real estate markets will be covered on our show. Joining me on our panel today is Louis Camarosano, who is a, was the ex-general manager at HomeGain I mean, is often cited in the, in, in the industry as a real estate expert in the Wall Street Journal. Forbes, CNN Money, Smart Money, MSN, and numerous others. He actually runs a blog at smoggled.com, that's S-M-A-U-L-G-L-D.com, which um, is a great blog, talks a lot about real estate economics. Um, he's going to go into more detail today about a blog that he just recently put out with uh, what the Fed's doing and is this the end of the real estate boom, so to speak. Um, he's off. He also... Um, is currently consulting companies on marketing and media, strat media strategies, and you can get a hold of him by just going to his website at smoggle.com. Lewis, how are you doing today? I'm doing grand, Ryan. How are you doing? I'm doing great. You know, I could be doing a lot better if interest rates hadn't moved up about 75 basis points since early May. Um, as you know, uh, you and I both very closely follow what's going on with the Fed, what's going on with interest rates, and you know, a 75 basis point increase in interest rates in, in literally less than a month is almost unheard of, but not shocking considering the fact that you and I have been talking about this for, for some time now, two years, really. Um, what's your take on what transpired last week with the Fed and Ben Bernanke? And obviously you wrote a blog, but I'd love for you to give your insight um, as to, you know, where you see things going overall, interest rates, the economy, um, and is, is real estate you know, is it could it be doomed? I mean, or could it could it stagnate? Well, Ryan, you and I, you're correct. We spoke for years that when interest rates go higher, they will go higher quick, fast, and in a hurry. And they've done that. And we'll see what happens to the 10 and 30 year notes today. You're right, they've gone up and, and the amazing thing about a point seven five basis point increase is that's from only a, a three, three, three and a quarter percent. So on the, on the 30 year note, so the percentage increase is massive, not just the 0.75 increase in just less than a month. Um, right. where, I see the, where, the, where I see the economy, Ryan, going is because they've thrown out this almost certainty of paper, the bond markets have reacted and basically killed the refi market because interest rates are now closing in on almost 4% on, on the 10 year. Um, What's going to happen, I believe, is the economy will start to slow, slow down. And that will give the Fed the ability to say, oh, sorry, we didn't mean it. Um, we're going to increase the size. That will create even more volatility because Bernanke even said, and no one really focused on this in the last press conference, he talked about tapering, but he also talked about adjusting if necessary. Well, Right now, all people heard is he's going to taper, and he doesn't know how much they're going to taper and when that's going to be, as you pointed out last week. But people are prepared for the taper, and they know. The markets are telling the Fed, if you cut back on the size of your purchases of mortgage-backed security and U.S. Treasuries, the markets will collapse. And I don't think he realized that. He said, I don't understand why – yeah, interest rates are, are heading higher. And my question is, well, <laughs> Mr. Fed, if you are basically the purchaser of last resort or only resort, who's going to buy them if you don't? And if you don't buy them, the price is going to go a lot higher and the, and the, yield are, the price and the yields are going to rise. So if that happens, that's going to have a devastating effect on the overall economy, the real estate market, and of course, the stock market. So the question for the Fed is, what are they going to do? It's not enough, and I think Krugman pointed this out. I'm on his side on this one. I'm never on his side. But basically what he said was, because he's a fan of QE, Infinity, and Forever, that yes, the Fed can go back and increase interest uh, in, and um, increase their bond purchases if the economy falters, 
but they lose credibility in doing so. And I think that's the big problem. Now, we're entering into a very volatile period, and as you and I have always pointed out, markets hate uncertainty. And right now, the markets would rather bet that the uncertainty is the Fed is going to not slam on the brakes, but say, as they say, take their foot off the gas. Yeah, and my question is, Lewis, too, is, is you know, the timing of this just seems kind of odd. I mean, they have to know that they were basically the, the backstop for, for the mortgage interest rate markets. They had to know they were the lender of only resort, as you, as you said. Why would they choose now? Why wouldn't they just wait until the end of this year, and then when, they re- when they're ready to taper, just do it, instead of, instead of upsetting the markets? And, I mean, they had to have known that by, by making a statement that's so clear as to, hey, this is what we plan on doing, but then at the end of that statement, in the same breath, saying, hey, but if it doesn't get better, we're willing to do this. Why would you upset the market? Is it, do you think it's to just, just keep gold and silver prices in check it to, try, to try to give, um, you know, I guess – uh, positive confidence to the overall market that the economy is doing better? Is, is that what you think that what the reasoning behind this is? You had mentioned that before, that what the Fed wants to do is say, look, we've solved the crisis. We did QE3, we did QE2, we did QE1. Everything is fine now. Thank us very much. And now we can start to cut back. That's one, one theory that they want to be able to say, We've done our job. Look how well the economy is. And you hear all these stories, right, about how great the economy is. It's coming back. And basically all they do is they point to the stock market and the real estate market. And, of yep. course, I know they can turn on a dime, and then they've printed all this money, and you're back to square one, and the stock market is down again, and the real estate market is down. Another theory is, as you point out, if gold and silver get out of hand, as they were starting to do in 2011, it starts to – take away confidence of, from the dollar. And the United States benefits and needs to preserve its status as the world reserve currency. If they don't have that, you know, we're no longer the world's economic superpower. So they have to toe a fine line between juicing the economy and debasing the dollar. Now, unfortunately, when they juice the economy, it creates an imbalance. They only juice the stock market and the real estate market but they don't create the productive environment. They don't create the employment that's needed for an economy that can do without federal stimulus. And I think the third thing is the noise is starting to get louder from not just the sound money people, but from the Bank of International Settlements and others that this has gone on too long. How long is it going to, how long are you going to continue to flood the markets with liquidity? And when are you going to stop and yeah, I think, that, I think that's a big component of it, Lewis, because um, – but realistically, they don't have a choice but to continue this. And I think that's like you said, they're going to end up realizing that the uh, overall employment situation is not getting better. We have – the employment um, we have weekly jobless claims coming in this Thursday, which will be something to definitely keep our you know our finger on the markets is what's going on with that. We also have Case Shiller Index uh, tomorrow. We have um, consumer confidence, new home sales. This week's going to be huge. This could be I mean this could be another killer week for interest rates. And I'm really curious to see um, what these reports show. If 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 what I think should happen is, and if I, I feel like these reports are manipulated how they see fit anyway, um, I, would, I would say that I, w- I would expect for some of these numbers to come, start coming in negatively so that the Fed can turn around and, and start saying, hey, looks like we're not going to be taking, you know, uh, not going to be stopping buying anytime soon. Because they've had such a ridiculous overreaction, or not really overreaction, but um, just the, the right reaction to what he said that. I don't think that they want interest rates to go from basically 3% to 5% in less than two months. And that's where we're headed at this point. And, Ryan, here's a question. What happens if interest rates do start to rise and continue to rise the way they did in the last three days straight up? What does the Fed do? Even though they're doing QE, QE3 to infinity, at some point it actually hurts their, their goal, because if you continue to print money in light of the fact that interest rates are rising, and that causes them to rise higher because people start to realize, wait a minute, the more they print, the less likely I'm, I'm going to get repaid, rates will continue to go higher. So the Fed really only has one tool. They always talk about the tools that they have. They have one tool, put their foot on the gas and print money. And that's worked in their mind so far in keeping interest rates 
low. But what happens when interest rates start to rise? What can they do to stop that? They, they don't have anything left. I, I mean, th- this, is pr- this is like the thing that you and I feared the most, I think, which is, was when interest rates started to rise. I mean, the whole – what they're banking on, the whole recovery of this economy, was basically essentially the real estate market and, and, and the flood of, of, of cheap money for, for banks and hedge funds and everybody else to, to – basically pump up the stock market, which is exactly what happened. But I'm seeing it here on the ground level working with clients. Just the other day, we went from having a client that was pre-approved on a loan for 3.5% now is, is now at 4.25%, okay? That just changed his buying power significantly. So he's no longer looking at a $400,000 house now. Now he's looking at probably a $360,000 house, okay? And right, so that's going to have a, an effect all the way ac- all across the country. This is not, And this is going to force home prices right back down. Right, but that guy, at some point, if he has to look at homes small, small enough to meet his budget, he won't buy. Exactly, and he'll be forced back into the rental market, which there'll be a, then there's going to be a higher demand for the rental market, which is going to drive rental prices back up, which is what we talked about, the inflation, what typically happens in, in these type of markets. We're going to start to see, I, I have a feeling, especially in the rental market, um, uh, some substantial increases as if they weren't already headed up to begin with. Because people uh, end up being kicked out of the market either because they can't afford it or because, as we've talked about, the main thing is it's not just interest rates. is what is the state of the economy? Are people working 40 hours a week? Is unemployment down to 5 or 6%? No. There are large numbers of people out of the labor force, the most since 1979, the, the labor participation rate is the lowest since 1979. The people that are working are working about 34 and a half hours a week. So, and, and then, of course, you have the new generation of home buyers, the millennials, who are more unemployed and more underemployed and have student debt. So where are they going to come up with the, the ability to buy a home if interest rates go higher? When they probably can't even buy one, even during six months ago when interest rates are at their lowest and price, home prices are, were relatively tame. Well, if you think about it, I mean, it's hard enough to get a loan as it is right now, right? Even if you've got, you know, you're a full-time employee, you've had a job for two years. I mean, you've got some assets in the bank, your credit's decent. It's still difficult to get a loan for that person. But imagine exactly what you're talking about, the part-time employee that's not, you know, that's ours. You know, you have have to have employment for at least two years at that part-time job in order for them to count your income. Otherwise, you're not getting a loan. You're going to be forced to rent. An interesting story to the part-time employees, I had a friend that went into Carabas, which is like an Italian restaurant, a chain, um, sat down. It was the last, it was the last pay day of the pay period for that restaurant. He overheard the manager speaking that they were basically short-staffed because they didn't want to bring in all their servers because they didn't want them going over their 35 hours. They wanted to keep them in basically part-time stats. So what they're doing is basically – doubling up their workforce with part-time employees and not keeping full-time employees on staff because they see what's going to happen in 2014, basically, when Obamacare kicks in. And they're basically setting up for it now to go ahead and just flood the market with part-time employees. This isn't good for anybody when we have nothing but part-time employees, right? Would you, would you agree? 100%. But I have a question for you, Ryan. We spoke for the last two years about, and it, it seemed to be pretty good advice that, look, the economy isn't that good, but if you can afford it, interest rates are low, there may be inflation in the future, if you can get a hold of that 30-year mortgage, lock in your cost of shelter, you'll be, you'll be in pretty good shape in the coming years. The question yep. now is, what do people do in light of the fact that it looks like there's going to be extreme volatility in the markets, rising interest rates, and we really don't see that improvement in the economy what advice can you give to potential home buyers and also home sellers? Okay, well, I, my honest opinion is right now for home sellers is that this is probably the best time that you're going to have to sell your home probably within the next six months. You need to do so, especially if you're considering making that, you know, your, your next purchase, your, next, your last purchase that you're going to you know, retire in that home or you're moving up from a town home to a single family, you should probably do that now, right, because with the, with the increase in interest rates the way they are, it's going to put a lot of uncertainty in the market, but it's also going to get a lot of people that are sitting on the fence off of the fence. 
because they're like, you know, well, it looks like I missed out on a 3%. Now they're going to the fours. I better get them before they go to the fives. I, I do think that regardless, whether interest rates are at 3%, 4%, or even 5%, that you still need to consider buying as an option because those are still historically low interest rates where you can, as you said, lock in your long-term cost of home ownership. And, you know, even at 6%, it still makes sense. But what you need to be doing is, is, is not worrying as much about the interest rate as you do with the affordability of that home. And I would say that you should probably start today by, you know, seeing what your options are, knowing what your, you know, your potential payment is. If you were able to sell your home and, and you had that money you could actually put down on another home, is that, is that feasible for you or not? I mean, most people talk about it. The biggest problem that I see with most people is that they, they're very good with talking with friends, neighbors, relatives about the things that they want to do. But the reality of it is is that they haven't even talked to any professionals about where they currently stand with their finances, with their credit, you know, how much equity they potentially have in their home. Just because your neighbor sold his house for 400000 doesn't mean your house is going to sell for 400000 So there's a lot of, you know, ifs and buts in, in, a, in the language of a potential home buyer or seller that I think that the smartest thing to do is to just sit down with a, a local lending professional and a local real estate agent. If anything else, it's no different to me than, you know, you calling up your stockbroker and, and having some sort of uh, annual review or semi-annual review. To me, you should be doing the same thing with your real estate portfolio. You should know what is your equity position in your, in your property. Do you have the potential to go and buy another house? It's nice to know those things. You don't ever have to do anything with it. But the reason why it's important is because interest rates are constantly fluctuating. And with this 75 basis point increase in rate that we've had in the last month, and I'm looking right now on my computer and we're another 15 basis points down today in price. So it's probably going to be another eighth by the end of the day. And I don't really see anything until tomorrow when these reports come out. Rates could continue to go higher. But at the end of the day, would you be happy, Lewis, if you were still able to lock yourself in at sub-5% interest rates, historically knowing where interest rates have been? Yes, and I think what's going to happen, Ryan, is we're going to see the housing market continue to keep up its steam through the summer because people will rush to purchase houses before the rates rise. Yep. As the rates rise, then it will fall off a cliff because a lot of inventory will come to the market to meet this demand. And at some point, though, when the rates rise, people realize the economy isn't there, all this inventory has come to market, and the housing market goes back down. I've been hearing all these people saying, oh, it's not a bubble because they're not even near the 2005, 2006 heights. Yeah, those prices were ridiculous. Those are the normal that we need to get back to. Right. And and also, this economy in the last four years is solely based on juicing the housing market. And once that taper go, you know, once the Fed tapers and pulls back the stimulus, stops buying the mortgage-backed securities, stops buying the U.S. Treasuries, and interest rates go higher, and the stock market goes lower, their whole wealth effect where people now feel wealthier, they have money from the stock market, they feel good about their houses, they're spending money. All of these consumption-based metrics come right back down, and there's no production or employment behind it. And therefore, we may see, and it will give a false signal to everyone, everything is fine, that even though interest rates have gone higher, the housing market is still robust, and you'll hear that through the summer, and then it will crash. Yeah, I mean, and, you know, that typically our spring to summer market is when everything is booming. Everybody's, you know, a lot of the people that are putting their house on the market in the summer have been starting to plan to do that probably back in the winter, right? Because we know that the sales cycle of people, when they start thinking about it, you know, six months to a year in advance. Now we're speeding up that timeline, I have a feeling, because everybody's seeing interest rates move up. And I would hope that real estate agents across this country are calling their clients up, the potential ones that want to put their house on the market and telling them to do it as soon as possible. Because, you know, with all, I mean, literally, financing kills deals all the time. If somebody is qualified yesterday and you're, you're in the middle of a negotiation and they lose a half a percent and they're not locked in, that financing could fall through. So I think that people who are, like you said, going to be rushing to get their houses on the market through this summer and then into probably latter part of this year, like you said, I would start to see 
you know, some de- declining values again. Now, in Northern Virginia, like I said, we, we have a supply and demand problem. And what I, I do feel that although the 30-year fixed rate mortgage market the, um, is going to be going up, I, I have this gut feeling that we're going to see adjustable rate mortgages start to go back down at the rate of the, the basically 30-year mortgages going up. Does that make sense? Absolutely. Once the rates start to rise and people start to get priced out, the market will meet them and say, hey, we'll give you an adjustable. You can still get into a home while rates are low. And absolutely. And, and that, see, that's, where, that's what the investors really love. They love to be able to jump back into the adjustable mortgage because they know that they have better margins there. They know that those things are going to adjust um, at some point and they're going to be able to, to have, reap some rewards versus, like you said, the Fed is buying up pretty much 80% of all the mortgage-backed securities, right? What, what private investor wants to buy mortgage-backed securities at 3% or at a 3.5% coupon? Nobody does. Why would you? And that's why the stock market's getting flooded because they're, they don't want the returns of, of, of bonds and everything else when they can go into the stock market, which is basically just buying itself up over and over and over again, which is, is pretty much, in my opinion, set the crash as well. I don't know how you feel about that, Lewis, but I can see the writing on the wall on that one. Um, it's, it's, pretty, it's pretty amazing to me that, you know, the stock market's at where it's at. I, was, I thought interest rates would, would have started to go up a little bit sooner, um, but I guess now, now with the Fed making those comments, it spooked everybody. We and, said there was going to be a spark. We didn't know what it was going to be, but that would set interest rates higher. You didn't think it would be the Fed. <laughs> well, they shoot themselves in the foot, you know, and that's what they've done. And, I know. And you heard, you heard him in the press conference. He said, oh, I'm... Um, yeah, I don't understand that one. See, he also said gold isn't money. There's a lot of things he doesn't understand. Exactly. Or, yep. or maybe he understands them but ignores them because he knows what his mandate is. Right. Yeah. To continue to bail out the banks by providing cheap credit. Well, and, you know, you and I have talked in depth about, you know, when there's so much artificial manipulation with markets, it only takes that one little small spark to ignite everything. And, you know, that's exactly what he's done. And now I have a feeling we're going to start to see in future meetings that he's going to try to, you know, basically retract a lot of what he said, and, but it's too, it's too late. You know what I mean? I think that in you're not going to be able to trick people into what because we know what you're doing at this point. Well, I think, you know, I thought he was going to do it this time because I've been saying, you know, that he's going to talk paper and print paper. And so far that's what he's done. I mean, he can talk and talk and talk. He hasn't actually pulled the trigger and even if they do taper, Ryan, you know, we talked about this last week, the first taper, you know, will go from $85 billion a month maybe to $65 billion a month. That's right. still $780 billion a year, which is larger than the first two QEs. Right. Now, then he said, oh, and then by the end of 2014, we'll stop. He can't see that far in the future. So many things can happen. So I think people are taking them at face value that they want to taper. And I think they do. I think they realize they look foolish. You know, QE1 and 2 are a novelty. I think QE3, Infinity, the markets are starting to think is a joke. And I think that also ties into the concept. He cannot appear to be just the guy that wants to print money and uh, keep interest rates artificially low, especially since we're not seeing the real benefits. So they're playing this game where they're saying, oh, there are benefits, so we can stop. And the second they said he's going to stop, they said, no, there really are no benefits. And the one benefit you created, which was a roaring real estate and stock market, is no longer a benefit once you stop juicing the markets. Right, exactly. But, you know, the funny thing is, is though, it, to me, he would have been better off to keep doing that because it, it would have actually helped the economy improve as little as it may be, only because – Equity, the equity in people's homes are going up. So what's what's happening is, is that people are taking home equity lines of credit. They've got you know money at their disposal to refinance now to go out and put on that new deck to get the landscaping to get all these other things. So I think that these businesses, you know, that are surrounded in you know by the the real estate market have been helped at this point. But now that we have interest rates going back up, I can really start to see that all the effects of the low interest rates are going are, are going to go away. Of course, but you see, a consumption-based recovery can only go so far. Because Oh, absolutely. And, and I think that's what he's realizing is that consumption really hasn't gone up that much. You, I mean, if you think about the QE progression, 
the real estate market did not come out of the doldrums until interest rates hit that rock bottom low. What was it earlier this year? Yep. At, at that point, people say, "Okay, thank you for the gift. I better go and buy a house." Right. But up then, it really didn't work, and as you see, and we will see as rates rise, then the interest or the ability to buy houses kind of goes away again. And yep. I think the Fed realizes they can't keep interest rates at the levels they were earlier this year for the next three or four years, hoping and waiting for the economy to improve. They really are in a bind. If they continue with QE, they're going to undermine the value of the dollar. They're going to just print themselves into oblivion. But if they stop, they risk cratering the entire economy. And the two good parts of the economy that are still there, the stock and real estate markets. Without those, you don't have any consumption. Right what you're looking for, because if the stock market goes down, the wealth effect goes away, and people feel poor, and if people have less equity in their homes, they feel poor. So you can't even get that little portion of the economy, well, it's a large portion of the economy, spending 70% of the GDP, but you won't even get that, because that'll go down. Yeah. And then you won't have underpinnings of investment in new factories and new businesses. Well, the question is going to be, how far do interest rates go up? You know what I mean? We've had a 75 basically basis point increase in a month. Do they go another 75 basis points? Do they go another point? Do they go two points? Because typically when you have these type of things happen, I mean, they typically can, you know, continue to unravel. And I mean, we've broken all levels of support um, where this thing could get really out of control really fast. Um, and and all what people were saying was, well, that's okay. When interest rates rise, it means the economy is better. no. Interest rates are rising not because the economy is better. It's because everyone is on notice that the Fed's going to stop buying mortgage-backed securities and U.S. Treasuries to keep interest rates low. Right. They're not rising for the right reason. If, if they were ramping up because the economy was ramping up, you and I would be celebrating and so this is great. You know, we can absorb these higher interest rates. The economy is strong. You know, the morning in America was Ronald Reagan in 1984. But that's not what this is. These are rising interest rates because the market is spooked that the Fed is going to stop artificially manipulating interest rates. Yeah, and I mean, if the economy was really improving like they think, then if interest rates even went to 5 or 6% and, and, and real estate sales were still healthy, then we would have, I would think, a better economy. But that's not going to be the case. You know, so we're, gonna we're, we're definitely not going to have people buying at the 6% level at the, at the levels that they're buying at right now. Now, it will be uneven. I think, I think in your area, and, and we have to be cognizant that this is a nationwide podcast, and we're talking generally nationwide, but yep. in, in your area, there, there are some different market factors. Maybe you want to cover those. Yeah, and I, and I think that that is an important factor. So, you know, we, we t try to talk nationally speaking, but obviously there's going to be pockets throughout the United States, mostly in your metropolitan area. So in, in the, where I'm at, in Northern Virginia, the D.C. metropolitan area, we're going to be isolated from a lot. In, we're not going to be completely, you know, immune from everything that happens, but the amount of jobs here uh, in relation to the rest of the country it, it, there's quite a, a big difference there. And I feel like, you know, we've kind of made it through some of the difficult times here um, okay just because jobs continue to come in. But I think that this could be a little bit of a, a, a different time for us now, though, only because there's still all the uncertainty about the budget. I've talked to, I can't tell you how many government contractors that have got everything on hold right now. They've cut half their workforce. This is going to be a continuing trend even in D.C. So, and that's what's kind of odd about the whole thing about the Fed's timing of this to me is because I, from everybody that I've talked to, even in the D.C. area where, you know, business is typically booming compared to the rest of the country, people are getting laid off. Companies are shutting down. And now interest rates are going back up. I mean, this, this doesn't really bode well. And especially for higher-end price properties, and I mentioned on a previous show that, you know, about 30-some percent of all you know, real estate transactions are cash right now, which tells me that it's not as much people that are buying their home to live in as their primary residence, just investors that are swooping up the stuff. So, and remember, guys, when I say cash, that cash is not always cash like in somebody's bank account. A lot of the big investors, when they've got a couple million dollars, they can go to the bank and get lines of credit 
where they basically had free reign to, to, to you know, write, write checks for these properties and close in like seven days or less as long as they're putting down 25, 30% of their own money. I know because I have one. So I can kind of speak, you know, uh, telling people intelligently that you can get these things. They're out there. But when it looks like a cash transaction the way it's coming through because it's a lot of credit. But there's a ton of that money that's out there. And I feel like what could get really interesting, Lewis, is that when we have so much, you know, so many people buying, investors buying, that, like you said, when the demand for buying a home decreases and people are forced into renting, and those rent prices increase, it's going to be really interesting to see what people can actually afford. Well, and you also have to look at the flip side because we don't really have a crystal ball. What if the rents don't rise and the anticipated return that these investors thought they were going to get don't materialize? Well, now you have a concentrated risk where you've got companies like BlackRock and so on who have invested a lot of money using leverage and cheap cheap interest, low interest rates to buy all these properties, if they don't fill them up, then they're in a position where the real estate market has a much greater concentration of risk. It's not spread across uh, Tom, Dick, and Harry. It's spread across Tom, Dick, and BlackRock. And, and therefore, there, there's a larger concentration of the risk that if the properties don't go well, you're back into foreclosures, you're back into stock market crashes, and so on. So it's, that really wasn't a good thing that interest rates were low that allowed not Tom, Dick, and Harry to invest in real estate or to buy a primary home, but allowed speculators. I'm, I'm all in favor of speculation, but not when you have government helping you or the Fed helping you speculate. They weren't yeah. looking at something and saying, hey, this might make sense to go in and rehabilitate these properties. I can do well. No, they were basically given a free pass to do it. Yeah. And the thing is, it's back to, if it works out, it works out great. If it doesn't, well, what's going to happen next? You know, yep. are they companies going to get bailed out? You know, they're going to talk. You see, the problem with housing is it's not just that somebody lost money in the stock market. It goes to the social fabric of the community. Somebody lost their house, their home where they live. And that's why you get these solutions, these political solutions, where they try to save housing. When somebody loses money in the stock market, it's boo-hoo. Somebody loses their house, it, that's not the the reaction that people take. So it's, we'll see what happens. I'm not optimistic. I'm generally an optimistic person, Ryan, but um, they seem to have created a very volatile situation by doing something that's never been done before in history, which is yeah. this isn't a changing stimulus where, you know, there's a little slack in the economy and, and, and the Fed or the central banks have to kind of juice it. This has been continual. Right. And the monumental amount of... of liquidity pumped into the markets for five years, and then you've got Japan doing it. it. It's global, too. Yeah, absolutely. And, I mean, you know, obviously I have a real estate business here in Northern Virginia. I, You know, I, I love to sell people's homes. I love to help them sell their homes and make money and do all those things. And the reason why, you know, this show is a little bit different is because, you know, when I talk to my clients, I'm pretty much talking in terms of how I can help protect them, and I feel like I'm protecting them by telling them, hey, you know, you're selling this house, but remember, this this house that created all this value is not really um, an asset, so to speak. It's a place you live. And the next place that you're going to buy, don't buy it as an investment unless you plan on renting that out, not buying it as your primary residence to live in, and you're going to call it investment, because that's really not. It's not an investment. And, I mean, the, the, the cold hard truth is right now, guys, is that, you know, the clients that I'm working with, that I'm talking to, sellers and buyers alike, I'm telling them, look, I don't like where the economy is going. I don't like where interest rates are going. I don't like the Fed, the artificial manipulation of interest rates. I don't like any of it. So what can you do right now is to try to take advantage of the rates at the levels that they're at right now. Don't worry about where they're going tomorrow. Don't worry about where they're going six months from now. Because if you try to figure this stuff out, you'll be you'll be completely probably you know throwing darts in, in the dark because we. We were wrong, Ryan. We thought all through 2011 and 12 that rates were uh, going to go higher, and they went lower against us. They went against us, and now when everybody thought that interest rates were going to stay, you know, stay lower, go lower, they shot up, right? right? Because as soon as you know the media starts really pumping that, oh, this is a great real estate market, and all this, that, and the other, look, look what happened. Interest rates shoot up on us. So, and of course, all the, these reports are now going to be trailing behind this. So. 
they'll continue realtor, uh, you know, basically NAR, which is the National Association of Realtors, they'll be pumping out there that the real estate market's never been hotter. But yet there's going to be lagging trends. So we won't really know until what, the fall? The problem with Kitty Schiller is it's a decent index. It really is, except that they generally release – I think what are we going to get um, the next time it comes out? What are these numbers going to reflect? Case May? Schiller, I believe, comes out. Yeah, I believe it comes out tomorrow for May. Actually, it April. It's a- April, April, actually. So there's a huge, there's a huge time where a lot can happen. A lot has happened since April in terms of interest rates. So you look at that April number, and it's going to look pretty good. Yeah, well, the estimate is for there to be a 10.9 percent year-over-year increase nationally and a one and a half percent month month to month increase. Okay. I mean that probably happened and if it didn't, um it doesn't matter anymore because we're in a new market dynamic. It's almost July. Exactly. Yep. Yeah, and you know, I think that, you know, it's very easy to get caught up in all these numbers, the statistics and, you know, what employment is or isn't. I don't really take too much stock in a lot of these reports. I have to look at things black and white, okay? Where are you today? What can you afford today? What do you think that you'll be able to afford a year from now, five years, and ten years from now? You know, do you you have enough money saved up to get you through being able to make your payments for a year if you were to lose your job? These are all questions that most people don't ask themselves, right? It's an emotional emotional decision that's based upon, you know, whether it's the husband or wife, they fell in love with the house and, now we've got to figure out to find a way to make it work. Where you made a, I have a different point. Approach. You made a very important point, Ryan, that looking at those numbers is futile because, and you pointed this out in the past, the only thing that matters, unfortunately, is not what the numbers say or your analysis of them or what you think, is what does the Fed think of those? You have to put yourself in the shoes of, okay, there's bad economic news. Okay, the Fed's going to go, okay, that's good for us because the Fed's going to keep interest rates low. It's basically, it's pointless to go, other than if you're a Fed watcher, analyzing data means nothing. And you'll drive yourself crazy trying to make sense of it unless you look at it through the lens of what the Fed does. The Fed is monolithic, and whatever happens in the economy is going to run through the Fed lens. So you're making a point that if, you're a potential home buyer or seller, analyzing the data isn't going to do you any good. You have to analyze your own economy, not the general economy. Yeah, and I think that one of the biggest problems is where do most people get their media from national news or, or you know what I mean, uh, newspapers that are, you know, presenting all of this information. And when I sit down with clients, I, I like to tell them that I don't really care about what's going on nationally because it's really irrelevant. Um, <laughs> right. You know what Which I mean? I- it's really irrelevant. Your bank account, your job, your your needs. What kind of house do you you need to have? What are your plans for retirement? Not exactly. what is the what is the Fed thinking about the latest case Shiller report? Exactly. Does it does it matter what somebody is making in San Francisco? Does it matter what their home prices are if you live in Nebraska? No, because the employment situation is completely different. Your supply and demand. Your your home prices might have been stable for the last ten years and never really changed, but. They don't ever speak about in local market terms of what's going on in every single market and how interest rates have affected those markets. Those are the numbers that you really want to see. And, you know, I can tell you from my perspective what's going on in my market is uh, it's red hot. It is absolutely red hot. And there's a house, there's a house that comes on the market that's priced right. It's gone in less than a couple of days. It reminds me of exactly the same thing that we had five, six, seven years ago and we're right back in that same situation. However, I feel like, you know, we just hit bottom with those 3% levels of interest rates where everybody was finally willing to push all their chips in and finally make the move. But now that we've had the increase back up, it's either going to push half the people off the fence so they do sell and buy another home, or it's going to say to the people that we're considering, they're going to say, well, you know what, we're just going to hold tight. We're not going to do anything. I think it's going to bring a lot of sellers out and it's going to flood the market with inventory. Yeah, and it very well could. But what will the, the telling sign will be when we look at these local numbers, when we come back, you know, two months from now after interest rates have had time to, to settle in, what, what the demand was. How, what, do we now have an increased supply of homes on the market? That's what's going to really be the telling sign. Now, will the demand be there to meet that increase in inventory? 
Yeah, and, you know, I'm just not so sure that there is going to be. Um, <laughs> I've kind of heard, I mean, I've just heard so many people talking lately. The, the economy that the Fed talks about and Congress talk about is not the same economy that I'm looking at. I don't see jobs that are, that are so abundant, that are all over the place, that people are, you know, cheering because everything is going so great. It's still a struggle out there for many. And to think otherwise is, is, is crazy. I mean, we've got, what, I want to say it's 60-some million Americans that are on food stamps alone. I mean, we've been increasing those programs, right? Everything is increasing for, for people that are struggling. Um, middle class, which is a lot of what I deal with, some are, it's 50-50 split. Some are moving up and some are moving down. So, like I said, is, is, a, is a potential buyer or seller in today's market. Look at interest rates as... What's your, is it affordable for you? I mean, I think that, you know, it's very easy to get caught up. Well, my neighbor got 4%, so I have to get that 4%. Or um, just last night, this is a, for instance, I met with a seller, and they said, hey, well, we, we, we basically have heard that this is a seller's market and that we shouldn't have to pay closing costs. Well, who told you that? Well, it was my neighbor up the street. Well, I need to tell you that based upon all, you know, my, me reviewing everything that's sold in your neighborhood in the last six months, the majority of them have all been sold with seller subsidies of close to 3%. So the reality is one thing, and, and what people see is another. Well, that's you making the point that talking to a trusted advisor, especially in a real estate transaction, we can hammer this point forever, is the most important thing you can do because the professionals not only know the area, they know the market, they know the dynamic, and they, if they've done their job, they also know you, and they know what your circumstance is. And it's, and it's the professional's job to kind of talk clients off the ledge, educate them, explain things to them. I often hear, you know, the real estate professionals, sometimes mortgage brokers, they're exasperated that someone doesn't understand something. And right. I say to myself, oh, that's because you haven't told them. Yeah. If they knew everything and they knew what they were doing, they don't need you. So, you know, your client is there as an opportunity to educate and, and really help them. You're not just there to collect the commission. Well, you know, and a lot of the marketing that's out there, Lewis, is not education-based marketing. It's, it's gimmicks. You know what I mean? Right. It's I'll sell your home in 30 days or I'll buy it. it there, nobody's really telling people what's going on in the market. I mean, the conversation that I had last night was, you know, obviously the numbers of what you have in mind are important, but only the market is going to dictate as to what we get a contract for. But on the other side of this, you guys have long-term plans, which are A, B, and C, right? How do, we, how do we meet those goals? Well, first thing is we need to get this house under contract. And if, if you have it in your head that you're not going to pay any closing costs, well, then you might have just eliminated 75% of the potential buyers, Right. And, so and some time what on market to, and some price exactly. appreciation. Yeah. So let's say that you, you you turn down this offer, you wait, you don't now you don't get another offer for 30, 45, 60 days, and now this time, not only is it asking for closing costs, but now they came off the price fifteen thousand dollars. Well, I'm going to be the one that I'm going to have to say, hey, I don't I don't want to say I told you so, but this is just what we're looking at. Whatever you have an offer in hand, you're better off to look at it, even whether it's countering offering or whatever you're going to do. But there's a lot of people that just say, you know, I'm not even going to respond to that. Well, that's to me, it's, it's the wrong approach. Absolutely. Um, but, but most, you know, most, most um, professionals, so, and there are plenty of them that aren't that good, they're just looking for the commission. And they'll always say, if you're a seller, oh, it's a great time to sell. If you're a buyer, great time to sell. Best, best time ever. And, and that's really a problem with the industry. You know, if, if lawyers went around saying there's never been a better time to bring that lawsuit, they'd be laughed out of the business because right. that's not what you're supposed to do. You're supposed to give advice on what your options are. Litigation, lawsuit, maybe one of them. But you don't advertise when someone comes in and says, oh, yeah, straight to court. But well, most, many, I shouldn't say most, many real estate professionals, and I would say real estate unprofessionals, are constantly telling you what you want to hear. You want to tell your oh, Best time to sell. You want to buy, best time to buy. And it's right. not. It's whether it's the best time to sell or buy for that individual. And it's never, ever the right thing to say that right now is the best time to buy or sell a home. 
Because that means all times are the worst times. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> it, 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 you know, for you guys that are listening out there, if you want to reach out to me as a resource on realestate360live.com, that's realestate360live.com. When you go there, you can enter in your email in the stay in the loop section, um, and you can get in contact with me that way or ask a question on that website. Even if you're in a different state um, outside the D.C. metropolitan area, I'd be glad to connect you with somebody that I feel like, you know, is a professional in their local area that, you know, you can deal with and get good advice. As Lewis, as you just mentioned, interest rates could be in the 9% range, and it could be a perfect time for somebody to buy, right? Yeah, absolutely. Because, and, and that's what people forget. Everybody thinks that just where interest rates are, that dictates whether it's a good market or not. Well, if, if you're buying your primary residence as, a, as an asset and you're basing it upon interest rates and all that, that's not a good decision. I mean, there's people that all of a sudden get business going. They, they start a business, or let's just say they start up a, a painting a painting company, and all of a sudden, you know, they're just they, they found a niche market and they're killing it. They're making good money, and we have interest rates in the eight, nine, ten percent range. They are now ready and willing to buy a house, even at the higher interest rate level, just because of the financial position they're in. Now, that's not going to be everybody. That might not even be the norm. But when I'm sitting down with that client, I can then say, well, it looks like you're in a good, a good, a good place, a good financial position. Now, are they going to get necessarily top dollar for, for you know, if, if they have a house to sell? Maybe not. But at that point, it's a good decision for them, and it's not based off of just interest rates. And they always say the, level of the three um, rules or characteristics of real estate are location, location, location. But I think what you're saying for a, for a customer, you have to personalize, personalize, personalize what that client wants and help them meet their needs. Now, yeah, you have to take the market into consideration, but the main driver is how does this person fit vis-a-vis the market and does it make sense for them to make a move and how can you help them make that move? Yeah, and if you're, if you're well, and there's a lot of people out there, and I think it's a lot of what you talk about. Everybody's saying buy, 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 buy. Real estate agents are constantly saying that because they want a commission, that's their job. I mean, even if it's, you know, not the right time for somebody to buy, they're telling them that. And mm-hmm. that person's buying a house because the interest rate has to be 4%. Well, maybe they shouldn't be buying because if they, it has to be 4%, that's telling me that their qualifying ratios might be a little tight. It might be a little on the high side, which is probably means that there's not much margin for error. If something comes up, they have medical emergency, they've got you know um, car accident, car troubles, whatever it is that might then push them into a bad situation where they lose their house. So, I mean, I'm always of the mindset is you need to be looking ahead for the future. Yeah, you need to find your family a nice home to live in, but you also, the whole reason why we had the mess the last time was because everybody got in over their head and it was cheap interest rates. I feel like it's almost the same thing that's just happened except for we had fixed interest rates this time versus last time it was more adjustable rates that came due and changed everything. So I, I mean, it's just, this, what you, this particular this particular um, housing boom I don't think will be as long or as strong. No, and that, that's always the case when you try to reheat the souffle. It, it just never gets back up. I don't even think you can reheat the souffle, but it will never get back up to that that peak as from, as from before when you try to juice it up again. Yeah, I mean, and I mean, I'm I'm actually you know I, I thought that things were kind of coming to their boiling point when, you know, the national media is, is actually saying, oh, it looks like there's not going to be a hangover in the real estate market, right? Whenever that, that type of media starts getting pushed out there, it's almost like a, a, a red alert for me that's, that's saying, okay, looks like national media has caught on that there's something going on with the real estate market now. We get, we're, we got, we're gaining momentum, and now we have this the Fed coming in right behind them with basically they're going to taper off mortgage-backed security purchases which is going to negate everything. Um, now, well, it's, it's consumer sentiment, when it's high, that's a red flag too. Consumer yep. sentiment was high in 2005 and 2006. Consumer sentiment was probably off the charts in 1929 in, in September and October. Consumers don't know anything because when you're at a party, at the height of the party, you think that's going to last forever. You feel great. You don't know that the party is going to end in the next half an hour. It feels like it's going to go on forever. So consumer sentiment to me is a is a number I wouldn't even look at. Consumers feel more confident. Yeah, 
the house went up and the stock market went up. They don't know the underlying reasons why they went. They just feel better, so their confidence is up. Yeah, and I, you know, I, I guess I have the contrarian view on everything, but I, I look at the stock market and I'm basically saying, okay, everything that I hear on the ground is that people are, you know, kind of scared for their jobs. Um, they're getting cut back from full-time to part-time. Everything that I'm hearing doesn't add up to, okay, why would the overall economy in the stock market be at the number that it's at? And typically when the numbers don't make sense or add up, there's a reason why. And they won't last. It could last longer than you might expect, and the change might not be imminent, but it is inevitable that markets readjust themselves to the actuality of the economy. Yeah, which is why almost two years ago, Lewis, almost two years ago when you and I were, you know, thinking interest rates were headed up when, and they actually ended up heading back down because you can manipulate a market for quite a while, right? And we can probably continue to manipulate interest rates, keeping them maybe sub-5% for another couple of years. We don't know. We don't know there's what that, the master plan is. Here's the Keynes uh, quote. Again, I don't agree with Keynes on much, but the one quote he made was, Markets can stay irrational longer than you can stay solvent. And that's true. You can have a rational situation for so long you're pulling your hair out. And eventually, you may be right, but you lose all your money waiting it out. Oh, absolutely. We, had yeah, absolutely. A bet against the interest rates, we were off for two years. We kept saying they're going higher, they're going higher. And they didn't. And, that, well, and then the Fed kept coming in with more and more and more respect to security purchases. Yeah. And, I mean, just, you know what I mean? They kept, they gonna, I mean, literally, had they not done that or to the extent that they did it, we wouldn't have ha never seen the lows of interest rates like we did. Right. We wouldn't have seen a stock market and real estate recovery. They, they had to do it because they had to show something for their efforts. Yep. The first, the first two did absolutely nothing for the economy. Now they're saying, hey, it did a little bit, so now we can stop. Yeah, and, and moving forward, I think what will probably end up happening is the interest rates will start to come back up, and at some point, the economic reports, the job, jobless claims, un unemployment, all that will come back out, and it's going to be worse than expected. The Fed's going to try to recover and say, okay, we're going to, we've got to buy more again, except yeah, I think at that point, it'll be too late. What's unfortunate is that the general consensus is, is that the Fed is somehow omnipotent and is going to solve these problems for us instead of letting the market readjust naturally, as it always does if you leave it alone. And, and we're, we're all thinking, what is the Fed going to do? How can the Fed help us? It isn't a good idea to taper now. It isn't a good idea for them to be involved to the extent they're involved at all. I, I agree. And I think it's actually sad that we have to talk about the Fed so in-depth every week because <laughs> they shouldn't have any involvement in this. That was not the original charter. It wasn't for them to produce employment. It wasn't for them to clearly, it wasn't for them to monetize debt and buy U.S. treasuries, and clearly it wasn't for them to buy mortgage-backed securities. It was meant, and they've had failed experiments with central banks before in the 1800s and so on, it was just to be a backstop bank. It wasn't meant to be the, the end-all, end be-all, which they think they are. Yeah, it's uh, it's definitely interesting times. Um, you know, obviously we're going to have to monitor this. At, you know, as things progress. But uh, like I said, as of this morning, it looks like mortgage-backed securities are down another 22 basis points in price. So maybe that's going to equate to maybe another eighth in rate. Just depends on where we go. But you know, we will keep our finger on this. Like I said, there's a lot of economic reports due out this week that we want to. Um, make note of, which is going to be the Case Shiller Index, consumer confidence, new home sales. Uh, we got quarterly GDP, weekless job week, uh, jobless claims, pending home sales. I mean, so we had a ton of stuff this week. So we'll definitely want to see if interest rates continue that upward trend, or if we get some sort of negative economic news that will help them at least at least start to moderate a little bit. Yeah, bad news is, is good news because if we Absolutely. get really economic news. The Fed might jump in and say we're not going to tape and we can continue to purchase the juicy economy. Yeah, we might just have a surprise Fed conference, right, where he comes out and says, oh, I take back everything I said. Now, you know, that we know that won't happen. But um, it, that's about the only thing. And remember exactly like Lewis said, whenever you're if you're trying to follow interest rates and what interest rates are doing, 
You don't even have to really read the headlines as much as just looking for bad economic reports are better for mortgage interest rates, and good economic reports are terrible for mortgage interest rates. It's really that simple. Um, so we'll follow that. But I wanted to, before we go and get off today's show, I wanted to give everybody this week's credit tip of the week. We give these every week to help people that are trying to put themselves in a position to buy a home, and they need to work on their credit. It, you know, credit is one of the most vital pieces of, uh, of information that you could ever have and, and work on because all lenders are going to look at your credit. So this week is basically how long can damage or negative items stay on your credit report. And as far as negative information, late payments are removed seven years from the date of occurrence. Charge-offs, settlement foreclosures, and repossessions are removed seven years from the date they became 180 days past due or went into default. Accounts turned over to collections remain seven years from the time they went 180 days delinquent or into default. Defaulted student loans that are guaranteed by the government can remain on your credit report for seven years from the date they were paid. Then we have public records. Bankruptcy Chapter 7s are removed from the credit report 10 years from the filing date. Discharge Bankruptcy Chapter 13 is removed seven years from the date discharged. Judgments stay on the credit report seven years from the filing date, whether they're satisfied or not. Foreclosures are removed seven years from the filing date of the foreclosure. Released tax liens remain seven years from the date released. This includes liens settled for less than you owe. Unpaid tax lien, uh, lines can remain on your credit report indefinitely. And paid and withdrawn tax liens are removed immediately upon request. Now, with me saying all that, just remember that I work with a company called The Credit Pros and that any information on your credit report that's inaccurate or invalid um, or that cannot be verified can be permanently removed from your credit report without having to wait this amount of time. So I gave you really those guidelines just as a, as a baseline. But let's say that you have an account where you know um, that something was paid or you have a collection that you're willing to pay off. What I would advise you before you do any of that, before you go paying them and they say, okay, this account was paid, that you should probably talk to the credit pros because a lot of the time you can settle with these things and actually get a deletion letter where you'll pay them and they'll agree to delete an item off your credit report. Many people, when you try to do this on your own, um, you screw it up because you go and you get that letter that basically says, yes, it was paid in full, but that item still shows the collection on your credit report and it just shows paid versus it being deleted like it was never there. So these are like little small, tiny things that could add up to hundreds of points on your credit report, which could be the difference. We just had a client from about a month ago that went with the credit pros that got her score from a 570 to a 700 in less than, less than 30 days. I mean, Lewis, that, that right there, that little bit of information that I just gave you right there is worth its weight in gold only because that was somebody that didn't think they could buy, that has great, had great income, had great assets, and didn't have great credit. And in 30 days, we, brought, we basically got her to be a buyer. And you also got her a lower rate, so even if she was able to get something at that, that, that lower credit report rating, and so you saved her money there. Not only that, we're saving her money for probably the next 30, 40 years of her life because every time she goes to apply for another credit card, another auto loan, and anything else, she's going to get a better interest rate than she was getting. So, you know, it's not just about, you know, us being able to get people into a home. We're trying to help you financially, um, which in, in my book, that's what's the most important thing, is taking care of the customer and putting them in positions to succeed. So if you guys are out there, if you'd like to be connected to the credit pros, you can reach out to me, like I said, on our website at realestate360live.com. Just click on the Ask a Question button on the right-hand side, and I'd be glad to answer any questions you have. If you have any other, if you'd like to give me a call, the number is 877-245-2030. And, Lewis, if anybody that's looking to get in touch with you, how can they go about doing so? I'll give you my, my website. It's smallgold.com, S-M-A-U-L-G-L-D.com. The contact information is in the About section. And uh, you can reach out to me if you're a real estate professional and want help with your marketing paper. Click campaigns. We're just interested in learning more about the economy and how it impacts real estate. I have a quick question for you, Ryan, before we sign off. Sure. You mentioned a seven-year um, period before a late payment comes off of your credit report. 
how late is there a grace period in general, or is it just a day's late and now you've got it on there for seven years? It's typically, um, I think it will, the actually one from, from uh, let's see, the one that you were asking about is going to apply for 180 days past due. So okay. it's going to go from 180 days past due late. It's not like you've missed the payment, you, you no. missed the first month and you paid next week. That's not considered late. Correct. Well, it, it, what will actually happen is, like, if you have a 30-day late, right, it will, okay. it will stay on your credit report until seven years from that 30-day late. Does oh. that make sense? Okay, yeah, yeah. But it, 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 what will happen is it'll start to taper off as far as how that's reporting negatively. It won't hurt you as much the further you get away from it. Um, it. And, and this is, and you know, that's a big thing. Like, let's say somebody forgot to pay a credit card payment. It happens to everybody. Um, whether, you know, they had automatic bill pay and for some reason the, the, the payment processor didn't send it through on time and you were now 30 days late unfortunately. Well, it's very difficult to negotiate with the bank to get these things removed. So let's say you did have that 30-day late on there. Well, it's important just that everything else stays clean in your credit report. You're going to get hit negatively, but if that's the only thing, you should be okay. Now, I would, I would still suggest that if you've had that permanent history, that you still potentially reach out to a professional like the Credit Pros and see, see if you're able to get that negotiated to be deleted off because they're, they're, they're successful sometimes. And there's nothing, there, you know, it's not hurting anything to try. Um, but other than that, like I said, I mean, you want to keep your credit profile as clean as possible, especially where we're at today in the lending world. It's important that, you know, you have scores that are probably, you know, 680 plus because lenders want to lend to only the select few that have great credit, got stable jobs. Um, but, you know, taking somebody from in the high 500s to 700 in less than 30 days is pretty much proof in itself um, that, you know, if you're just out there thinking about buying and you don't have the credit scores right now, that you can't have them, at, you know, in the next six months or so. And so, how do the credit pros get paid? What was that, Liz? How do the credit pros get paid? Okay, so typically what they do is they have different models. They have um, one model where you can, be, if you have a, let's say you have a lot of items that you need to get, you know, taken care of under credit report. Let's say it's like 20 or 30 things that you need cleaned up, right? They'll typically set you up on like a monthly plan where you'll pay them like $69 a month until everything is taken care of or you at least get a resolution on, on all those items. Or if there is an end, like just one item that you want negotiated, they'll just give you a fee for getting one thing removed or addressed, right? They typically will tell you about these fees before you even move forward so you know everything up front. They'll tell you if they think you got a good shot to, you know, to get something taken care of or not. Um, but it's not something that's, you know, especially if it's a lot of items, you might need to work with them for six months to a year to get everything sorted out. But Worth I it. can tell what well, yeah, exactly. Whatever the cost that they're charging you is, is peanuts compared to the amount of money that they're saving you long term. You know, and that's the important piece. Everybody needs to think long term. Protect yourself from future inflation by locking in interest rates now, getting your credit squared away so you can take advantage of those low interest rates. That's what everybody should be thinking about right this second. But that's all the time we have for today, guys. I appreciate your time. We'll be back again next week. Thanks a lot, Lewis. I'll talk to you soon. Thanks, guys. Thanks.